Uh, good morning, everyone. So uh, thank you all for submitting your projects. Uh, they've uh, been received, and uh, we'll start looking at those. I just uh, thought also to uh, just give a bit of context to this slide that I'm going to talk about for a few minutes. And um, one of the nice things a bit about working here at Mac is that uh, I get to do a lot of other interesting research around education and how, how our mind learns. And, and one of the ways that we can view that is by understanding uh, different uh, dimensions, right? And so we typically, in the research at least, looks at this knowledge dimension, which starts right down here at the most simplest bare facts, simple facts, and then you can go to concepts and pro procedures, and then metacognitive, you're getting more and more abstract as you're going along this dimension here. So, the, so your knowledge is based on concrete facts down here, and then very fairly abstract facts up there. The other axis is your cognitive uh, approach or your cognitive process, I should say. Again, starting simple, just simple recall of basic concepts, understanding concepts, applying concepts, analyzing, evaluating, and then that creative phase is the most extreme. So the reason why I wanted to bring this up is just to give a bit of context to the midterm and if you look back at the midterm question one and two was basic recall facts, right? So simple, short questions. You're essentially, you're operating down here in this, this area. You're able to recognize basic concepts, give me a few bullet points, um, list basic ideas around, say, what is a typical flocculent. It's a simple recall of factual information, right? You're down here, you're probably at the, the, the most bottom level in terms of challenge, okay? And then question three and four in the midterm started to move up. They're really just around here, right? So you had to think very carefully about that flow sheet that you've never seen before. Think about why flocculent was added to, um, to the particular point on the, it was on the flow sheet. Think about cyclones. Why, what's going to happen if you put one, which we studied one cyclone, but now what happens when you put two, right? So this is not something that we necessarily explicitly learn, so it's not an explicit recall of factual information, right? Which is, would be trivial because you, you've got your notes there in front of you. So why, um, why spend our time down here? And to be honest, when you graduate, you don't have the monopoly of being in this area. If, even if you're the only chemical engineer employed by your company, someone else can also recall factual information, or at least just look it up quickly, right? So you've got no no stake to claim if all you can do is work down here. You need to be start pushing yourself up into the abstract region as well as in terms of the complexity and the use of your mind, the cognitive aspect of applying and analyzing and evaluating critically certain information. Right, and so what the project does that you've just submitted starts to put you up in here where you're analyzing a new area, okay? What the what the midterm does, some of those questions, is they start to push you up in that, that area. What the assignments do is they start to push you up in some of those areas in terms of the more open-ended questions. And it's no good going and finding last year's solution and simply copying it and handing that in because all you've done is you've really just pushed yourself back down here. Okay, so if you're not challenging yourself to move up that zone there, then you're going to really find yourself stuck eventually because someone's going to quickly figure out, well, look, you've got no capability of, of doing higher level thinking, right? And um, as I said, you're not the only one that can do it. A company can easily find someone else to do work down here at a cheaper price. So if you're able to get yourself being able to judge, critically deconstruct concepts, integrate various ideas from this course, from other courses, uh, being able to just even uh, generate interesting new alternatives. And the peak here is sort of creative, very creative design aspect. Um, that's where you will, if you can do that well, you'll never uh, be looking for a job. Pretty much you'll be in, you'll be the one setting the terms for yourself, okay? So what I really want you to think about is seeing yourself climbing up here. And no one, especially not me, expects you to go from today where you're able to recall basic facts to being over there in no time, right? We intentionally, at least I do, intentionally bring you up to that level by providing you multiple steps of 
increasing challenge and complexity to get you there. Okay? So I just want you to bear that in mind as context for how I work in this course and for the reasons why certain things are the way they are. And I'll post this PDF to the course website. There's a lot more to it uh, that explains these axes, the X and Y axes, in, a, in more depth. Uh, so you can go there and look. Here it explains the one axis in a lot more depth and there's a, the other axis explained in more depth. So that you can see and really critically ask yourself, where am I? What am I really capable of doing? Right? And try to push yourself a little further. Okay? So with that, um, let's go back to the example we did. And I'm going to try and illustrate some of those concepts that I just spoke about in even this simple example and the upcoming work. Right? So last time we, we got this problem, and let's just recall because it's been a little bit of um, some time in between and you've been working on your projects that you may have forgotten some of the details here. But if you recall what we were doing here is we were running a lab-based system and in our lab we did a test with some contaminants and we were trying to adsorb it onto the surface of the adsorbents. And just I'll put up some details here. We had three grams of adsorbent. And we had 0 0.05 grams of solute. We were able um, to take up 96% 90 per uh, of that solute was removed out of solution and placed onto the solid. So we adsorbed that amount. And we calculated last time that CA was 0 0.002 grams of solute remained per liter. And CAS was 0 0.016 grams of solute per gram of adsorbent. Okay, so maybe just um, put some of those numbers in perspective on the plot we derived. Right, now the plot was deceptively simple, right? And so recall the plot essentially said CAS is some equilibrium constant times CA. Okay, now that's very simple. That's a factual recall piece of information that tells you the relationship between the concentration in solution and the concentration on the solid. Okay, and it, it is deceptively simple. Here's CA, here's CAS, and the slope was a value of 8, and let's just put, put some units up on there. So it's a straight line, and K was the slope, and it had a value of 8. So what units was that? 8 liters per gram adsorbed. Okay, so the units are consistent here in that case. So where are we on this plot? Well, if we're in the lab system, we're, we can read off our CA and CAS values, 0 0.02 grams per of solute per liter. Okay, so that's my lab operating point, and that corresponds to a value over here of 0 0.016 grams. Now, the y-axis is units of grams adsorbed of solute, so grams of solute per gram of adsorbent. So it tells you how much solute you've adsorbed per mass, per unit mass of adsorbent. Okay, so that's, that's basic information, substitution into equation. Um, anyone can really do that. But now let's try to push the bounds a little bit. <clears throat> that's the lab system. What's going to happen here? Well, let, let me maybe ask you this case. This was with a particular adsorbent. Um, does it say here which one? No, it doesn't. But let's say you go and locate a different adsorbent. And 
it, you do a lab experiment with the same particular uh, concentration, and now you, you're operating there. Is that a better adsorbent or a worse adsorbent? So you go pick, you change your adsorbent out for another one. So maybe instead of activated carbon, you use alumina. Is that a better adsorbent or a worse adsorbent? Worse? Any reasons for it? Okay, so because we want to get this contaminant out of solution, what essentially is going to say is that here you're adsorbing less solute per unit mass of adsorbent. Okay. So it's a worse adsorbent because you're going to need more of it in order to do the same amount of work. If we look then conversely an adsorbent that had a slope that was steeper, that would be a better adsorbent, right? So here again, don't just look at an equation. I want to ask you now to push yourselves a little further and say, well, what, what can change here, right? I'm not going to ever give you two values and expect you to calculate the third. That's basic information, basic activities. Anyone can do that. Let's work with, this, with our minds a little bit, right? So K, which way does K need to be in order to be a better system or a worse system? So We've got this idea here now that we need to take K up if we want it to be a better adsorbent for us. Okay. Let's take a look now at the rest of the question that I'd asked you to do. So um, remember we said in class last time we do this by a simple mass balance where we take, we're going to do this now on the full scale. So here we did it in the lab. The full scale is we would like to take 400 liters now of solution containing the same amount of contaminant. Okay, so the batch adsorber is 400 liters with the same concentration. And what we would like to do is you need to remove 99% of the contaminant in the full scale apparatus. Okay. So what we showed last time, the approach to doing this is it's a mass balance where you say mass in is equal to mass adsorbed plus remaining in solution. Okay, and if you put in the numbers over there, I'll just sub in quick for you. The mass that goes in in the full scale system is 20 grams goes in. And of that, some mass is adsorbed onto the solid the rest is remaining in solution. Well, what is, that, what is that split? Well, we're told that we need to remove 99%. So 99% is absorbed and 1% is remained in solution. So if we split it out in that ratio, that must be that 0.2 grams over there. And for the remainder in solution is 19.8. to get it in that split. Okay, but we still, we're still lacking some information here. Basically where I'm going with this is where are we on this plot? We're on the red line somewhere, but where are we? The lab is over here. The full scale system, where is that point going to move? To the left or up further over to the right? the right C a is going to increase <laughs> okay take a look at the mass balance over there which part is related to CAS 
this term over here, mass adsorbed, is going to be some relationship to CAS. And this is going to have some relationship to CA, the remaining in solution. So when we were working in the lab scale, our split was a little different. Our split was 96 and 4%. Okay. When we're now dealing with this full scale, we know that we're going to still be on the isotherm. It's just where, whereabouts. Well, we, we're setting more stringent con conditions for ourselves in the full scale system. In particular, we want only 1% remaining in solution. That CA is going to have a lower concentration. If CA has a lower concentration, we're going to be somewhere down here and then move over. Okay. So our full scale system is somewhere over there. Okay. And so what we can go do now is go calculate CA. CA is the mass of solution, a mass of solute per unit volume of solution. Well, we've got 0.2 grams per unit volume of solution, in this case, 400 liters. Okay, so CA can be calculated in that way. And uh, it's a number that's 0 0.305 grams per liter. And then CAS we get from the isotherm. Once you know CA, multiply it by 8 to get CAS, which in this case is 0.004 grams of solute per gram absorbent. Okay, so we are, we're shifted down to the left, closer to the origin on that red curve. Okay, and then the last question says, how much adsorbent do you need? Well, Here's, here's our hint. We know that CAS is 0.004 grams of solute per gram of adsorbent. So that's the concentration of solute on the surface per unit mass of adsorbent. Well, we know the numerator, the grams of solute, we adsorbed 19.8 grams of solute per unit mass of adsorbent. So um, let's just finish up those calculations over here. We use the symbol S. So CAS is 0 0.004 grams of solute per gram of adsorbent. That's 19.8 grams of solute was adsorbed per capital S grams of adsorbent. And then if you solve for S, you get 4,950 grams. Okay, so we'll use that symbol capital S to indicate the mass of solid we need. Now, let me ask a further question still, once you have those numbers down. Later on, we, we might want to regenerate this adsorbent, to reuse it. Okay. So we call the name of this, um, this red line is called an isotherm. And it's called that because it's for a single specific temperature. The therm part indicates that, the isotherm, one temperature. Um, so one way to regenerate this solid is to heat up the system. And that will start to let the solute that was adsorbed onto the surface starts to come off. Okay? So which direction does this line move up or down if I heat the system up? So this line might be at 25 degrees Celsius. What, 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 where's that line going to lie if I take the system to, say, 60 degrees Celsius? It, it must go down, OK? So if I heat, heat the system up, OK, 
what this is going to do, we're going to heat, heat ourselves up. So we're currently at 0 0.016 grams of solute per gram of adsorbent. If I heat, heat, heat it up, I'm going to move to a lower value on the y-axis, and the material will desorb. Okay? Just equilibrium will simply start to take the material away from the surface. And that, sol that adsorbent is regenerated in that way. Okay, so what I want you to get from that discussion is a single very deceptive linear uh, equation or nonlinear equation here has a whole lot of richness to it that we can look at from an engineering perspective. In first year, second year, your lecturer might have given you two out of the three values and you calculated the third, but we're, we're beyond that point right now and we need to be thinking a bit more from it, about it. Okay, so, so that's the linear isotherm, but what people quickly discovered is that it doesn't hold um, very well. If you go look at real systems, this isotherm as shown there tells you that you can go increase CA and you'll just keep adding stuff onto the surface and CAS will go up as well. But there's a finite capacity for the adsorbent and so a better relationship um, that can be derived is this entirely empirical model. This model has no basis in theory at all. It's simply a mathematical trick almost, a mathematical artifact to get the data to match the, and fit a line through it. Okay, so in practice what we can go do is run a series of experiments. How to collect the data for this? Well, go run a series of experiments with at increasing concentrations of CA and measure CAS and you'll develop a curve that might start to look linear initially, right? That looks great. It looks like, wow, I could go fit a straight line through that. But if you keep going up with CA, you start to notice that sort of behavior. So the linear approximation is great if you're operating in this region. But beyond a certain point, that linear approximation breaks down and we move to the Freundlich model, which is shown over there. Okay. And again, the question, which way will the isotherm shift if the temperature is increased? Again, that isotherm starts to arc down again the same, for the same reasons as before. Okay, so you can plot a log-log plot and calculate your constants M and calculate your constant K over there. Okay, so if notice when m is 2, then essentially that's just a square root function. <clears throat> now there's, later on what happened is that people sat back and looked at this a little bit more carefully and said, well, we can get some sort of theoretical derivation for this that um, matches with what we think is going on on the surface. And so the, the line of thinking is if you look at a surface, there's a series of vacant sites, so we'll just call those S. These are empty spaces, almost like a parking lot, that's available for material to come and adsorb onto. So you've got your adsorbent over here in solution, and this material will move to the surface and adsorb at that particular site. And the rate at which it will move towards that site is obviously going to be some function of the concentration of A. So the concentration of A. The more A that you have in solution, the more material you've got, the higher the probability that a molecule of A will encounter an open site. Okay, So it's going to be in proportion to that. It's also going to be in proportion to CV the concentration of vacant sites. So an adsorbent with a high number of vacant sites per unit mass, so a high number of parking lots or openings or gaps for that molecule A, the more openings you have, again, the higher the probability that you're going to get attachment occurring. And then we're going to put a rate constant Ka there. And that's a second order reaction. The forward, you, if you want to see it as a reaction, A, plus S 
doesn't react in the classical sense of a reaction, but it's, it's the coming together of two species, and in the forward direction, we'll create an AS bond there. Okay? And we have the reverse reaction that's possible. We'll call that lowercase ka minus a. The reverse reaction also exists. So let's write this out here. The forward reaction is a rate constant ka times the concentration of a in solution times the concentration, as it were, of vacant sites. The reverse reaction is how do we desorb The rate of desorption is going to be in proportion to the number of sites that are occupied, which is CAS. So if you've got a lot of occupied sites, equilibrium will tell you that some of that material will start to desorb. Well, the number of occupied sites is equal to the concentration of this CAS, the mol mass or moles of a uh, sorry, the moles of sites that have been absorbed per kilogram of solid. Okay, so we we can think of it in moles or or mass; it doesn't matter. And so your net rate is forward minus reverse. And when you're at equilibrium, that's got to equal zero. The forward reaction rate, the rate at which you adsorb, is the rate at which desorption occurs. So this, there's this continual mass transfer occurring between the sites. And we can also create an equilibrium constant, capital Ka. Equilibrium theory tells us that that ratio of the, ra the rate constants is equal to the equilibrium constant, Ka. So there's a little bit of problematic issue here. We, we'll obviously never know CV. Okay, that's a number we cannot possibly know, the concentration of vacant sites. We don't have the ability to figure out what that number is because it's changing right, over time. As material adsorbs, the concentration of vacant sites drops down. So we don't know that. And we've also got these rate constants, lowercase ka, lowercase k minus a, and this capital K equilibrium constant. Okay, but what we can do is um, Langmuir's isotherm derivation says once we sub in some of these values, okay, we can use that net rate equation, sub in capital Ka over there, and then also recognize that the total sites available is the concentration of vacant sites plus the concentration of occupied sites. So if a site's not vacant, it's occupied. Um, and so your total sites available, CT, is given by that number. And that might be a number we do know or could possibly f try to figure out your concentration of total sites available. Either way, after simplifying, you get a relationship that gives you CAS on the left and CA on the right. And we lump some of these constants up. So capital KA times CT we don't know capital K, we don't know CT. Let's lump that up into one constant, K1. Capital KA down here, we don't know. We just call that K2 for now. And if you're wondering why I'm using PA, PA is the partial pressure of A. PA is directly proportional to CA. So if I write PA, I could have written CA with a proportionality constant in front of it. And so this last equation over here does that for you. I've wrapped up the proportionality constant and pushed it into K1, and I now call that K3. Okay, so where, where I want you to go with this uh, thinking, the derivation is there for you to, to look at it in a bit more detail, if you'd like. But where I want you to end up with is understand that this derivation is derived from theory, and at the end, we get a new isotherm equation, K3 times CA plus 1 plus K4 CA. And if I plot that isotherm, I get something that actually makes a lot more sense. So CA, CAS here on the vertical axis, I now get 
something that looks like that. It actually levels off. As you go to higher and higher concentrations, it tells us that you reach some sort of finite capacity. Right? Even if I increase CA, I'm not going to get any more solid, sorry, I'm not going to get any more solute loading up onto my adsorbent. And that comes from this idea that there's a finite number of gaps or vacant sites. Right? So once those vacant sites are occupied, you really can't do much more. And as before here, we'll, you'll see that there's a region where the linear model does apply. Okay, so again, we could resort to a linear model if we know we're operating at low concentrations. But if we're operating at a wider range of concentrations, the Langmuir isotherm is more accurate. Now, for those of you that are in the bio program, you've seen this sort of equation. It's the michaelis manton model, and it was probably derived in the same way, so that's not surprising. If you're taking 4K at the moment um, and you're looking at catalysis and reactions on a catalytic surface, again, the same um, equation you've seen before in that course. The only um, caution I'd like to give is that when people in the bio course or in 4K, you look at estimating these constants, you want to know what K3 is and you want to know what K4 are, you've often used the you've done this, right? If you go look at this equation, you've probably seen, uh, well, flip it upside down. So you write 1 over CAS is equal to 1 over K3CA plus K4CA over K3CA. Okay. Yeah, you've, does that look familiar? Okay. And then the person that has told you, well, that's Y is equal to MX plus C. Okay, so you can go fit that data there by plotting a straight line and your slope is 1 over K3. But the problem is your intercept is K3 over K4. So you get any error that you estimate in K3 propagates into your estimate of K4. So that's a bad statistical approach to use. Don't use that approach. Um, rather use the E.D. Hofstede plot. If you click on that link over there, it shows you a far better way of estimating those estimates more reliably. Okay, so rather follow that approach, okay, which avoids that sort of complication. <clears throat> okay, so perhaps I'm going to uh, work here with you on another problem. We'll, we'll look at another issue here. And to introduce this problem, I, uh, let's just derive a little bit of, of, of extra theory to solve this first. it over here. Okay, so the a little bit of extra theory that uh, is, you know already, but you'll see that this is obvious, but um, just to emphasize it, is that if we're dealing with batch systems, it's a closed system, right? So that valve is shut. And we put material in the tank. And the tank has uh, a certain volume, capital V. So your mass in, you're going to load up that batch reactor, mix it, and you've got your solids over here. So your activated carbon or whatever your um, adsorbent is. And material is going to load onto that adsorbent. And what does not load onto that adsorbent is then left in solution. So in solution at the end, you're going to have a concentration CA. So mass N is broken into two parts, as we've seen before, mass adsorbed plus 
mass, let's maybe be a bit more specific, mass of solute in solution. Okay, so mass of solute adsorbed and mass of solute in. So just emphasize that this is a balance on the solute. Okay, and let's maybe give, give some symbols here. We've never really defined a symbol for mass of solute that you've added to that batch reactor. So I'll just call it MA, the mass of solute that you add in at the beginning. You might even just want to emphasize that MA in. Okay. The mass of solute adsorbed, what's that going to be a function of? Any guesses? What is that? What, what it variables will influence the mass of solute adsorbed? How, can, how, may, how might you find that out? Just symbolically. It's not too hard. <laughs> Okay, it's going to be based on the surface area. Um, and when you get your provider, or if you're looking at an adsorbent, we have the isotherm for it, right? So we, we've got this idea of how much area is going to be attached onto, sorry, how much solute is going to be attached onto the area of the adsorbent from the isotherm. So if we're looking for mass of solute adsorbed, our expectation is to use some, something related to the isotherm. In particular, it's, it's going to be a function of CAS. And let's, uh, let's put units here, mass of solute in grams of solute. So CAS is going to be somewhere over there. Now CAS has units of grams of solute um, per gram of adsorbent. And just a second here, I'm going to switch to kilograms just to be consistent with the problem. So kilograms of solute per kilograms of adsorbent. So what do I need to make that, that balance, to make the units work? Okay, it looks like I need to give you a little bit more time. I would like you then to complete this equation, at least symbolically. I'll give you two, three minutes. Think, discuss it with the person next to you. And this is, again, where this critical idea of working through the problem and not just waiting for me to give you the solution. I'd like you to think through that and write out the rest of that equation symbolically.
Any suggestions? So this is obviously not, not correct as yet. Anyone like to suggest something? Yeah, should they? Okay, so times S kilograms of adsorbent. Okay, so we've got that part right. And then the last term. Remember, our units must always match. So we do need units of kilograms of solute remaining over here. Simple batch. This is 3K stuff, right? It's not. Maybe I'm just using different symbols to what you were used to in 3K. CA times V. Okay, so CA times V. Let's just take a look at those units. We've got units of CA are kilograms of solute per meter cubed multiplied by meters cubed. So that makes sense then for us from a unit perspective. And so we've essentially from a batch system got an equation that tells us where that, how that batch operates. This mass coming in will distribute itself into two por portions, what's adsorbed and what remains on the solution. And we've got that symbolically over here. So what our goal is with this particular question, let's come back to this question now, and um, we can start looking at where, what our aim is. Our aim here is use the isotherm determined from lab values. So Again, this isotherm, we did several experiments of varying CA and measuring the resulting CAS. And once plotted up, um, after you've done your lab experiments, you notice that arc shape. So you, you, you can guess then that a Langmuir isotherm is appropriate, right? So no one tells you, use a Langmuir isotherm, use a linear isotherm, use a Freundlich isotherm. The way we figure that out is by plotting the data first, and it's a guess and check. Well, it's obviously not linear. Well, it could be Freundlich, right? So if we look back at the Freundlich shape, there's a plot that shows the two. Freundlichs um, will actually just keep going up and up and up, whereas Langmuir levels out and actually flattens. So that's a hint to us that um, there's, there's likely a flattening out here that Langmuir is more appropriate. Okay? But again, if you, if you were not sure, if you didn't go out far enough, you would fit both models and just check which one has the lowest residual error. In this case, the Langmuir isotherm was figured to be the most appropriate, and there are the resulting values. Okay? So we've got that lab data. What this question says, show the operating point on the isotherm. This seems a little bit strange. Um, what is the operating point on the isotherm? Well, it's essentially asking, where are you on this curve? Right? Are we down over here? Are we up? over there, right? So where along that curve are we? So what information are we going to need to solve that problem? What's, what are you going to be looking for when you're trying to solve this? This is a perfectly valid question that's being asked here. As an engineer, you would want to know, where am I on that isotherm? It's going to play into how much adsorbent you need to purchase. Helen, do you have a... You're going to need to know a value of either CA or CAS, right? One, one or the other, and once you find one, you'll, you have the other. So which one are we able to find over here? We know the, the mass in, right? We're given information that tells us that we're treating 0.25 meters cubed of wastewater with 0.25 kilograms of phenol per meter cubed. Okay, so we know the mass in. Um, we know the mass of adsorbent. There's three kilograms of activated carbon. 
We know the volume, two and a half meters cubed. Okay, so we've got this problem here of not knowing either of the two variables that we actually want, want one of. Okay, and you're starting to see the pieces fall into place. Right, someone back here, suggestion? Okay, we can plug in one equation into the other or solve two equations in two unknowns. An even easier way is recognize that this is a linear equation. You can rearrange this for CAS is a linear function, mx plus c, where x is CA. Maybe just, let me write it that, that way. Some slope times CA plus some intercept. Okay, and in fact, it's a line that goes something like this. Okay. So solving two equations in two unknowns, you know from 3E, from Dr. Adams's course, that that's the intersection of those two curves. In particular, um, let's just draw that up here. That curve will look like this. Okay, so that purple line represents the batch equation. The white line represents the isotherm for the adsorbent. And where the two intersect is where you have to operate. Okay, so you're looking for the intersection of those two points, solve two equations in two unknowns, or sub one equation into the other, and you can get CA and CAS. Now, here's, and that's, that's, um, Again, on that scale I showed you at the start of the class, that would be somewhere in the low, low to middle region, that sort of challenge involved with getting this. But where I want you to also now to push this next is ask yourself as an engineer, this is where the system is going to end up, right? That's the equilibrium point at the end of the batch. Where are you starting? Right? When you just start the batch and you just add the adsorbent, where are you on that plot? Are you over here? Are you up here somewhere? Are you on this curve? Or are you on the purple line? Okay, you're on the purple line and most of you are pointing down here for me. Okay? So when you start off, you're over there. That's the concentration of phenol per meter cubed. CAS is zero. You've got nothing adsorbed at that moment. So as the batch progresses, you're gradually going to move up towards that point. Can you go further? Can you go beyond this point? No, you cannot. So if you understand what equilibrium says, equilibrium says, now, when you get to this point, material is adsorbing as fast as it's desorbing, so you can never go beyond that point unless you change the isotherm. Okay. The other question that you'll be immediately asking yourself as an engineer is, how fast does it take to get there? Okay. So I'll leave it at that. We're at the end of the, the lecture time. So we'll keep going with, um, with this idea of adsorption in Friday's class. But I, I hope that today's class at least just gives you a bit of insight into thinking and some strategy for, for yourselves.